this time. And I'm really excited to introduce uh, two uh, Advocates for Ohio's Future members and a new friend uh, joining us today. Uh, Joel Potts will be first. He'll be joining us from the Ohio uh, Jobs and Family Services Directors Association. Then uh, Rachel Massoud, she's with the Ohio or, or County Commissioners of, of Association of Ohio. My goodness, that coffee needs to kick in, doesn't it? And then Michael Corey with the Human Service Chamber of Franklin County. Uh, so Joel, whenever you are ready, please go ahead and kick us off. Uh, thanks, Kelsey and Tara, uh, not just for the opportunity to speak today, but for all the work you guys have done. I mean, everybody keeps using words like unprecedented and, um, you know, just extraordinary times. But the, the leadership that you guys have provided has really just been incredible, especially in doing things like this to keep us all uh, connected. You know, communications are really tough and to have an organization like Advocates for Highest Future where we can all, you know, come from very different um, uh, areas uh, within the advocacy community, you know, where there's so many things that are going on. There's, there's really no other opportunity where we can all speak like this and be able to communicate and, uh, and, and share off of each other and really build on our strengths. And I think the residents of the state of Ohio have been extremely well served by your leadership and all the work you're doing. So thank you. I, I, I can't be more, uh, um, sincere in, in saying how much I really appreciate and respect all, all that you, uh, and at AOF and Center for Community Solutions are doing. So thank you for, for that leadership and again for this opportunity uh, for us. Uh, this is obviously a, a unprecedented time. I, I, I'm getting tired of using that. I'm getting tired of using the new normal because I, I don't think anything is, uh, is set. Um, and I appreciate giving us the opportunity to talk about this topic because it is really challenging and we'll get into some of these details. But there are lots of things that are really kind of driving uh, some of these decisions. And if you think back, it's hard to believe it's been almost six months exactly to the day. But if you think back um, to when we first were shutting down the schools and people thought, oh my God, they're, they're going to shut down schools for a couple of weeks. I can't believe we're actually going to do that. And then we shut down businesses. Uh, everybody thought, wow, this may end, go all, all the way to the end of the school year. And then you know, surely this will be better, you know, by the 4th of July, and then surely it'll be better by the end of, of the summer. And now, you know, I think everybody's kind of going to this short-term crisis management to long-term, you know, this thing is going to be around for a while. And it's, 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 it's not just changing. It, 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 it has changed. And, you know, at the way we're going to be in the future is not the way that we've been in the past. And in some ways that's, that's great. Um, you know, we've learned a lot. We've done things in the past six months that would have taken us six years of pilot projects uh, to, to get it accomplished, if, if at all. Um, and we have really done a lot of things in a very short period of time that we've seen has worked uh, that will hopefully result in a much longer term, more effective, more efficient streamlining of our services, better services to clients, uh, and really utilizing all the resources that we have to bear to really help individuals not just address their immediate needs, but really look at issues that address poverty and help individuals uh, ultimately get out of poverty. So I do see a lot of positive uh, opportunities. We've seen the promises of, of some of our new uh, computer systems, the things that they can do to help us better serve clients. Um, and um, you know, we, we've seen, uh, we've had lots of experiences that have been really positive, but um, for, for as difficult as it is, and it's been very difficult, and I think we're actually heading to a, a much more difficult period here in the next few months. Um, but ultimately, I do think there are some really positive uh, changes that we're, we're going to see out of this. So we're keeping our fingers crossed. So obviously, we've had increased demand. I mean, we knew this was going to be the case. We've had, I, I think I saw the last numbers were like 1.7 million individuals who've applied for uh, unemployment compensation during this this period of time. Uh, in the last six months, we've seen significant increases in our caseloads. We've had over 350,000 new uh, SNAP applications. We've processed 54,000 new TANF applications, hundreds of thousands of additional Medicaid uh, applications. Uh, we saw real spikes that occurred in March and April, and then we saw a second spike in August uh, which we think is a direct correlation of the loss of the $600 weekly benefit that individuals were receiving, unemployment that many Ohioans were receiving. So we have seen those, those jumps. Um, we also uh, know that the next four months are going to be particularly challenging when it comes to SNAP renewals. So um, 
um, those were the, that were due in March through May. So we do a typical redetermination period. They were deferred for a six month period. So it was great for the clients. It was great for the workers. You know, we, we suddenly had a situation where individuals were able to um, uh, continue to receive their benefits and we didn't have to go through all the paperwork and all the eligibility processes and things. But just like we've seen a uh, moratorium on evictions and utility shutoffs, uh, those are temporary. Doesn't mean that work's going away. Doesn't mean those issues are going away. It just means that they are deferred. And it was the same thing for our renewal. So they are now going to be coming due. You know, those that were delayed in March and May within starting this month, they're, they're starting to come due. And we need to start working those cases. Um, generally, the fall is our busiest time. You know, we, we've got a, a big challenge, uh, especially October, uh, November. That's also the uh, period for individuals who are in the Affordable Care Act who are receiving health care benefits. That is their open enrollment period, and that always generates lots of additional work, lots of additional calls, and changes in people's benefits. So at the time that we're normally busiest anyway, we also have several months of um, back work that has been delayed that's also going to come due. Uh, this increased uh, workload is going to mean uh, longer wait times, slower processing times. Uh, our counties, especially our metro counties, are going to need significant overtime uh, to be able to complete the necessary work that's going to be out there. So, um, you know, while, well, like I said, we've been able to maintain benefits, we've been bringing people into the system, we haven't had um, for the most part, we haven't been cutting individuals off and those types of things through the eligibility process um, that, that are no longer eligible. So they've continued to receive these benefits, but that work is all coming due. It's, it's not that it was, it was waived. We would love to see a federal waiver, you know, that just allowed us to not have to worry about the renewals for a 12 month period. So we can keep it on a regular um, schedule. Uh, to, that, to this point, that really hasn't happened. And I don't think there's much likelihood of anything until we get uh, past the elections and not just because of the election cycle and seeing what the outcomes, but I think, you know, individuals were really looking at this of what is the short term needs. And I think we're now finally getting to that point where we're looking at the long term uh, needs. Uh, we also know that we're going to be facing a in, in significant increase in need for services. Um, for those who may be facing evictions in the near future, utility shutoffs, as I said, those were moratoriums on the shutoff, but the bills are still due. Um, we know that we've, we've, the feds have just extended the moratorium for um, evictions for another three months to get through December 31st, but that means that at some point individuals may have nine plus months worth of uh, services um, that, that haven't been uh, paid for and those bills are gonna come due. And we anticipate seeing a lot of uh, activity, you know, when that, that occurs. And, and we're really concerned about our ability to be able to do that. Um, so, so lots of those kinds of challenges are coming and, you know, we know they're there and we're right now, we've been able to really keep up with things. In fact, I think in many ways, we've never been this current you know, and, and our ability to serve clients, we're getting them through faster, we're able to keep the services, we're, you know, we've taken care of a lot of our backlog, a lot of our paperwork, but that's because we haven't had to do a lot of the redeterminations and we haven't had to do, you know, the adverse actions and those sorts of things. That, that all will change sometime in the very near future. We also know there are going to be huge changes in employment and training, you know, which is the job part of job and family services. So we know that work and training programs have to be expanded. Just look at the sheer number of people who are unemployed who are gonna need employment services. Um, we also know state and federal work requirements are, are, are continuing to be a requirement. And that includes not just within the TANF program and the food assistance program, but we also have um, somewhere in the near future, the Medicaid work requirements, the state waiver uh, kicks in goes into effect January 1. We know that we're not going to have to do the work requirement on January 1st uh, for a variety of reasons, but sometime in the near future, uh, there is expectations that in addition to the work requirements for other programs, we also are going to have to do something within the Medicaid work uh, arena as well. We did just get good news this week that the state qualifies for is applied and has received a waiver for the able-bodied adults without dependents. Uh, within that program, there is a restriction that uh, for those uh, adults who don't have dependents who are uh, don't meet uh, other disability qualifications, 
uh, they are entitled to receive three months of food assistance in any 36 month period. And after that third month of assistance must work off their grant for a better, for no better way of explaining it, uh, or they would lose their, their food assistance for, for those months outside of that 30, uh, outside of that three month. The ABOD waiver lifts that so the individuals um, do not have to meet the work requirement as a condition of re receiving assistance. Now, I do want to make it clear, and this has always been the case with the ABOD waiver, they still have a work requirement. If they are assigned to do something and fail, they could be sanctioned, um, but um, they, they will not automatically be shut off after three months within that 36 month period. So um, we also know that we're going to have an increased need of services by both employers and employees. Lots of things have changed recently, and we're really concerned with employees as they've been unemployed for long periods of time. Lots of businesses, we're afraid, aren't going to be able to reopen, or those that do reopen are going to be doing so in a very different capacity than what they had before. I mean, it's clear, just look at, you know, restaurants and those sorts of things. I mean, so many of them, you know, I can look, I'm sitting in downtown Columbus, I can look up and down the street, almost all of those businesses have been closed now for six months and will be for the foreseeable future. We hope they're able to come back, they may not be. Those individuals who are employed there, you know, are going to need, um, likely going to need employment services. There's also just a fear factor out there. Nobody really knows the health risks. You know, there's a fear, you know, even if the individual themselves is healthy, they may be caring for somebody who's part of a vulnerable population. Uh, and that's going to be challenging. We also know with the education system, that's become a really significant challenge for potential employees you know, when they are also having to not just provide the care for the children during the day, but also get them the educational services and the types of things they need. So it may limit the hours that are available and, and different types of services. We're also concerned with transportation services. A lot of our local transportation systems are set up. In, um, you know, we, we can only provide, we, we can only pay for services that are provided. So you know, as there's fewer, fewer people that are going to work or fewer people are going to training and needing various types of services, that means less money is out there in the transportation world. And we're worried that we may lose some transportation services, could be taxi companies, uh, those sorts of things, bus services, certain bus lines, all of those things could be impacted. And those are going to be challenges for us, you know, in getting the skill set and, and doing the types of things. Child care and, uh, is just a universal problem for us. You know, there are lots of individuals out there that, that are working that need child care, that are trying to figure out, you know, the education world. Um, um, a lot of our child care providers aren't able to provide any care, or if they are, uh, because of all the restrictions, they're doing it in a limited capacity. So we don't have nearly the number of child care slots available uh, that we've needed in the past. And we know as we come out of this um, this shutdown period and people, more and more individuals are entering the workforce, the need for child care is going to be greater than it's ever been before. And right now we have fewer slots available than we had before the pandemic began. So that, that in itself is going to become a problem. We're also really worried about the TANF block grant sustainability. You know, that's been a conversation within the advocate world and with AOF and Center for Community Solutions for years. But the, the block grant primarily supports three things in Ohio. Um, it provides the uh, high works first program, caseloads, work requirements, administrative dollars, all of those types of things, PRC program support, work supports, family supports, and those sorts of things. Uh, it also supports uh, our child care program. And that's, you know, those, those things are really um, uh, big drivers. They are very, very expensive programs. And th those were challenging before this pandemic. Uh, occurred and we know that more TANF resources are going to be needed for child care. As I said, we've seen 54,000 new applications for uh, TANF uh, through this period. So we know we're going to need more for cash assistance. And then we also know for each of those individuals in the system, there's additional um, uh, support services those individuals are going to need. Um, so, so all of those things are really going to be driving uh, us. Uh, like I said, we still are required to meet work requirements. You know, one of the one of the things I think people have a hard time understanding with with our system, and it really puts I think counties in a rough spot. We don't create the bureaucracy, but we do administer it. And the bureaucracy itself, public assistance programs generally are eligibility based systems. They're not need based systems. Uh, so when somebody comes to us and says, "Hey, I just lost my job. I don't know how I'm going to feed my family," we can give them an application and hopefully, you know, get it through quickly. And if they're eligible for SNAP. 
you know, we can get them food benefits, but it is still eligibility based. They can leave our agencies, they can go to a food bank, they can go to a church uh, or some other advocacy organization and say, hey, I need help feeding my family and they can walk out with a box of food because those entities provide based on need um, more than, than we uh, um, do, which is based on eligibility. So um, that's a challenge. That's a real challenge. And I think throughout the pandemic, we've done a great job, the state and federal government, in supporting our systems to allow us to provide need-based services. So we haven't had to jump through those eligibility hoops. But that those eligibility hoops are going to come back, and that's, that's going to create uh, some challenges for us, and we need to be able to work on those. So with that, we do see a lot of opportunities within the JFS system. Um, first of all, the, federal, the, the state's willingness to pursue uh, and get waivers approved to streamline service delivery. It's been absolutely fantastic. They've done a lot of work with that. And as I said earlier, we're kind of going from a short-term view of what can we do to looking at long-term. You know, what have we learned? Are there things we ought to be looking for? Uh, remote work has given us lots of opportunities that we haven't really seen before. Um, a lot of our workers, some of our counties are reporting more than 90% of their workforce is now working remotely. Uh, and that's in large part due to a lot of the systems uh, that have either been already developed or being developed make it easier for us to provide clients, provide services to clients uh, at the non brick and mortar settings. So that allows us to work extended hours, that allows us to work in the evenings, it also allows us to potentially provide services to where clients are. Um, we can be in community centers, we can be at senior centers, we can be at libraries or food banks or those sorts of things. Uh, in the future. We've seen lots of abilities with what we can do with basic laptops and access to computer systems. We've seen lots of opportunities for the state to encourage them to keep these systems available later in the evenings and on weekends and those sorts of things so that we can do that type of work. Uh, and and we, we also think, you know, it can be a great recruiting tool. You know, a lot of uh, our counties deal with tremendous turnover. You know, we had such a solid economy prior to pandemic that it was really getting to be a challenge keeping good employees um, because there were good employees had good opportunities. There were a lot of better paying jobs, but if we can provide more flexibility and make it easier for those workers to be able to do their job, um, maybe not make them travel as much, not have to deal you know, with traffic, um, maybe work flexible, more flexible schedules around their family needs. If they've got to get the kids to or from school, or maybe they would rather work a 12 to eight shift instead of uh, um, eight to five, because that fits what their family needs are, family dynamics or home dynamics. You know, we now have seen, you know, the, the strength of those types of things. And we think that gives us great opportunities. The expanded use of call centers and county shared services. We've been building on this for the last few years, but really have seen the strength of uh, how our system can be so much more flexible and counties helping counties. Early in the pandemic, we had an experience where Lucas County, you know, due to some health scares and things, had their workers um, uh, going home and we and weren't set up yet to do the remote work. Uh, and we had actually some of our smallest counties were helping. Um, Venton County workers were actually helping do Lucas County cases so that the client themselves were able to continue to, to receive services, you know, through those call centers and through those county experienced workers being able to do that work. Uh, and everybody was well served. We've had other situations, several where counties had an outbreak and needed to immediately close their buildings and uh, other counties were able to use our new shared work experiences and be able to do that. That wouldn't have been able to, to happen a couple of years ago with our old eligibility systems, but we've seen some of the strengths and things that we can do with that. Lots of opportunities with equipment and technology uh, that we haven't had before utilizing um, technologies that allow us, you know, if clients want to sign up for text messaging, we can send them information through their texts. We can um, do our scheduling and those types of things to, again, help our systems to be more efficient and just overall finding new ways to do business. So while there are huge challenges, going to continue to be challenges, I think we're in an excellent position, as good of a position as we can possibly be. And uh, we're excited to, to see where it goes, but I do see lots and lots of, of real good opportunities uh, out there as well. So I'll go ahead and turn it back to you, Kelsey, and we'll hear from our other speakers and happy to do the questions, however you want to do them. Great, thanks so much, Joel. And uh, Rachel, go ahead and kick it off when you're ready. Great, thank you. Thanks, Kelsey, thanks, Tara. Um, 
I never want to be the person that has to follow Joel Potts because he's always so good. But, um, but here I am. Um, thank you guys so much for having me today. I'm going to switch gears and talk a little bit more about the overarching county budgets and the challenges that we've seen um, as a result of COVID-19. Um, and I want everyone to keep in mind that, of course, the situation is different in every single county. Um, we say a lot in our work at CCAO. It varies from county to county. Um, and the situation is no different here, but I'm going to talk about the overarching trends and what we've seen since March. Um, so to begin, I want to talk a little bit about what county budgets looked like prior to COVID-19. Um, we were finally starting to see some stability from the Great Recession and a series of painful state and federal policy decisions that really negatively impacted our general fund. Um, the reductions to the local government fund was $145 million annually across the state. Medicaid MCO sales tax elimination, $166 million across the state. And loss of Internet Tax Freedom Act, which was we were grandfathered in at Ohio, that actually went away most recently. That was another $40 million. So a series of painful cuts. Um, but, you know, we had a strong economy at the beginning of this GA. We had a very supportive administration and General Assembly that were really um, looking to partner with local governments. So we saw a massive increase in indigent defense reimbursement, $60 million additionally in the first fiscal year, $95 million additionally in the second. That was huge for us. Um, the implementation of South Dakota v. Wayfair, the internet sales nexus case, um, also huge for us, especially now um, in the pandemic, a lot more people are shopping online, and an increase in state child protection funding, which was also unprecedented. So at the beginning of this year, um, we were feeling pretty good about ourselves as counties um, after, you know, a decade of just being, um, being, being down. But then, of course, COVID hit. Um, so our primary concern um, when COVID-19 hit was, of course, sales tax revenues. Um, sales tax is the largest county revenue source. It is the lifeblood of counties. And in March, we were really concerned that, you know, mandatory business closures, stay at home orders, social distancing measures would result in dramatic decreases in consumer demand and thus reduce sales tax collections. Um, on the next slide, or maybe two slides, Kelsey, I'm not sure. Um, there is a chart, I think it's the next, yes, on the change in all consumer spending. This is from the Opportunity Insights Economic Tracker on tracktherecovery.org. This shows the cha percent change in consumer spending using credit and debit card spending, but the visual is good um, to have up while I'm talking about what happened with our sales tax revenue. Um, so, you know, we were expecting to see a dramatic decrease and to an extent we did see that in the early numbers. In March, we had um, sales tax was 8.3% below estimates. April was 24% below estimates and May 17.6% below estimates. But then, the subsequent three months, we started to see a comeback that was surprisingly strong that really we had not expected. Um, June was 0.1% below estimates, July was 14.8% above, and August was 4% above. So that swing from April where we were 24% below to July 14.8% above was huge and really something that we were not expecting. Um, so the question is what caused this? We're not, we're not exactly sure. Um, you know, the federal stimulus, the enhanced unemployment, $600 extra a week, the $1,200 stimulus check probably contributed to it, as well as pent up consumer demand, things were opening up. Um, we think all of that contributed to the rapid strengthening, but when we look towards the future, it's hard to say what that's gonna look like. Um, there's a lot of apprehension among state budget officials and county budget directors we know the unemployment rates, while they're down from the 17.6% peak, are still very high. Um, and once the federal stimulus wears off, you know, we're going to have another $300 extra a week, but will that be replaced with something else? Will there be nothing to replace it? Um, are we going to see weak revenues start to return? Um, and that's a real possibility that all of our counties are thinking about um, when planning their budgets. I do want to note that it's important when thinking about county budgeting Sales tax collection and when the money actually gets to the county is about a three month lag time. So those 24% below estimate revenues in April got to the county coffers in July. So when they're planning their budgets, that delay um, is important to remember. Um, other impacted county revenue streams on the next slide, you'll see um, gross casino revenue tax significantly weakened following the temporary closure. Um, they were closed for about three months 
that's roughly $100 million annually across the state for Ohio counties. Um, we're concerned that we might see a higher delinquency rates for property tax collections. Um, in the beginning, we did see a delay in property tax collections. We think most of that has subsided at this point, um, but we did see a delay to the second half of the year in some counties. Interest income for counties has fallen like it has for everybody. And although this doesn't um, relate to the county general fund, these um, gas tax revenues also took a significant hit because people weren't driving as much in the beginning of this. Um, and then of course the state also has to balance their budget. So we've received some cuts, um, that indigent defense reimbursement that I talked about before, we were expecting that to be a 90% reimbursement rate this fiscal year, and it will probably be more about 70%. So, um, you know, not a, it, that was about what we were at last year. So um, definitely different than what we thought it was gonna be. So what are counties doing um, now that we're in this situation? What actions are they taking? Again, it varies from county to county, but some examples of what counties have been doing, furloughs and layoffs, hiring freezes, delaying of capital projects, that's a big one, budgetary reductions, other cost-saving measures, including reducing travel and training reimbursements and cutting grant programs and extras. Um, and also they're, they're dipping into their county rainy day funds to account for the losses. Um, some counties have been really aggressive with this while others have made relatively few changes. Um, it depends upon the unique factors happening in each county, for example, some of our counties depend heavily on tourism. Tourism and hospitality are an industry that we know is going to continue to be hit hard by this pandemic. So some of those counties are not doing as well as maybe some of their neighbors who don't depend as much on tourism. It really does depend on, on the county economy makeup. But um, you know, I would say from where I'm sitting at CCAO, I think a lot of counties actually feel that they are in a better position today than they expected to be back in March. If you talk to county budget directors, I think they were a lot more pessimistic in those early months than they are today in September. But um, that's, that's not to say that counties don't have significant problems. Some of them absolutely do. And there is definitely a real possibility that we could see things go south again in the coming weeks and months. You know, maybe that consumer, um, pent up consumer demand dies down. Maybe we have um, a worse winter with the pandemic. Um, it, it's really unknown, but I think as of right now, a lot of counties would tell you that things have not gone completely off the rails yet. I do wanna note that counties are in the process of setting their budgets for next year. So their fiscal year lines up with the calendar year, January to December. So they're going through that process and um, you know, there are a lot of questions when budgeting in such an uncertain time when revenues really are still a big question mark. Um, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention one big tool that counties are using during the pandemic, and that is the CARES Act funds. Um, so the CARES Act passed the um, passed Congress and the president signed it at the end of March. Um, and it is, it distributed money to local governments and states through the coronavirus relief fund. And counties have received approximately 750, mo I'm sorry, $754 million in CARES funds um, thus far. So the majority of that 754 million was actually distributed directly from the federal government to the five largest counties in Ohio. Um, and then the remainder of it was sent out to the other 83 counties through the passage of House Bill 481 in the state legislature and a controlling board request um, last month. And those funds were distributed to all local governments in Ohio based on the local government fund formula. There is the potential for another 260 million more dollars to flow just to counties through Senate Bill 300, 357, which is currently pending in the House. Um, it is drafted to be distributed on a per capita basis. So that is different than the first two mechanisms. Um, you know, what the legislature remains to be seen, how that will actually end up, but it is per capita right now. Um, it's important to note that these funds cannot be used for revenue replacement at all right now. Um, there are strict guidelines coming from the U.S. Treasury guidance and FAQs and then the OBM guidance that tell our counties how they can use it. Um, it is not meant for any unbudgeted, or it is only meant for unbudgeted costs related to the pandemic and revenue replacement does not qualify. Um, there are 
a lot of creative ideas that counties have to use this money, um, especially in the human services space that um, they have been deploying and we've been working with our counties to give them lots of ways to use it, but strict revenue replacement is not on the table right now. Um, of course, the funds can be used to off offset increased funds due to COVID-19. Some counties are using the funds to partially offset public health and safety employee payroll. We actually got additional guidance um, last week that solidified that we can use the money for that. So um, that provides some budgetary relief, but as far as flexibility for revenue replacement, it doesn't exist right now. We're working with our federal partners at NACO to try and get that flexibility. We're trying to get more dollars and um, currently the CARES Act funds have to be spent by the end of the calendar year. We all know the pandemic is not going away at the end of the calendar year. So um, we're hoping to get that deadline extended so our counties have more time to use those funds. Um, the Ohio congressional delegation is supportive of what we're trying to do. It's the other states um, that are not as supportive. So um, we keep talking to them. The governor is supportive of that flexibility as well. Um, we are, we're hopeful, but you know, it's, it's Congress in the White House. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't hold your breath on that. Um, so all in all, you know, counties are facing some real challenges due to COVID-19. Our worst fears haven't materialized right now, um, but there has been fiscal pain obviously across the state. And unfortunately, the future is a big question mark um, as they go into their budgeting process for next year. So thank you so much for the opportunity again. Um, you know, I have my contact information on the next slide. Happy to answer questions at the end of this or after um, the presentation. And I'll turn it over to Kelsey and Michael. All right, you're up, Michael. All right, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, um, Kelsey. You've done just a magnificent job since you took the helm at Advocates for Ohio's Future. It's been a real honor to watch the organization flourish, especially when we've needed you most these last six months. Uh, it's really an honor to be a, a part of this group with, uh, with uh, Joel Potts, uh, whom I've admired from afar for years. In a past life, I was at Children's Defense Fund Ohio, uh, and. Uh, deeply appreciated and benefited from your work and leadership uh, back then. Uh, and uh, Rachel, it's very nice to meet you um, on this call. Um, so let me first say you've received a treasure trove of really valuable information from our first two speakers. I'm going to try and focus in on um, the health and human services provider perspective locally in Columbus and give you a sense too of what the fiscal situation is like and the service situation is like from the city of Columbus and county perspective, for fear of putting words in the mouth of the city and the county, I'll do my best to represent everyone uh, as, as fairly as I can. And I will use the coronavirus relief fund segue um, to start talking about things here. Um, but first, let me just give you a very brief overview of our organization since I assume that most of you on this call will not have heard of the Human Service Chamber of Franklin County we are essentially a chamber of commerce for uh, health and human services agencies in Franklin County. Um, we've been around for 10 years. We're at about 100 member organizations and uh, our job is to do advocacy and traditional business supports for our member organizations. And since March, we've added a third piece to that, which is PPE pursuit and distribution to our member organizations. So a big chunk of my job is working with the city and the county in particular, as well as with our, our state and federal elected officials or delegations uh, on the issues that are critical to our member organizations. And since March, we've been submitting weekly reports based upon qualitative and quantitative um, uh, submissions from our members to our local state and federal elected officials to give them a sense of what's been happening on the ground and what the effect on programs and services this, this crisis has had, and then the many crises that have emanated from it. Um, so the CARES Act was obviously a key win for all of us, and it has had much more of a positive effect than I think anyone really anticipated that it would. And one of our concerns up front was that there weren't any specific dollars for nonprofits in that legislation. But we did identify, um, as Rachel uh, talked about, the Coronavirus Relief Fund within the CARES Act as being a potential source of significant funds for the sector. The city of Columbus received about $150 million in the county. Franklin County received about $70 million. And today, in fact, just an hour ago, the city and the county announced 
um, awards to about 110 nonprofits in Franklin County of 20 million that they had pooled together of those coronavirus relief fund dollars from the CARES Act that will be going out to nonprofits in our community. I underscore that because those are really critical dollars, but it shows you how much time it's taken for those dollars to even be allocated, let alone distributed and have, have their effect in the community. The city of Columbus allocated 51 million of its 50, I'm sorry, uh, of its 150 million plus of CARES dollars just for human services. And prior to today's announcement, they had announced about $10 million in rental relief much of which has been routed through an organization called Impact Community Action um, and a million dollars for utilities relief. Um, that utilities relief has routed through 11 of our member organizations in Franklin County. They have another 2 million set aside for that, but they're yet to distribute that. The county did not divvy up their dollars in advance. They've just been kind of waiting to see where they could make investments and have been doing so in many of the same areas as the city. Um, but there's less clarity on, on how they've decided to divvy all that up. All of that said, um, the sector is reeling in Franklin County. The sector was reeling before the coronavirus crisis began in March, and it has obviously become that much more difficult. We have done four surveys with the United Way of Central Ohio of our member organizations and the United Way's funded partners to try and get a real time sense as we've gone along here of, of how this crisis has affected folks and affected agencies. In April, when we did this, 83% of agencies had already seen a loss in revenue, which is not a huge surprise. And 80% of programs and services that those agencies provide were either um, operating at a lower capacity or had ceased altogether. Um, now, when the PPP dollars started flowing, a significant percentage of our member agencies were able to take advantage of that. And that prevented mass layoffs and furloughs and obviously allowed programs to either continue or to resume at a normal capacity. So that, that had a significant impact. Um, but the revenue losses that we accounted for in July in our most recent survey in the sector in Franklin County alone were over $40 million. In Columbus, to supplement the CARES dollars and the city and the county's efforts, independent of CARES dollars to support the sector, two emergency relief funds came together, one from the Columbus Foundation and one from the United Way. The Columbus Foundation Emergency Fund, I think, amounted to about $7 million. The United Way Emergency Fund, I think, amounted to about $3 million. So even in the aggregate, that was just $10 million relative to a $40 million loss. We have been trying to take all of these numbers and communicate regularly with our congressional delegation, especially with Senator Portman and Senator Brown, as we push for another stimulus package to come together. And while there is bipartisan agreement on certain elements that I think are beneficial to everybody, PPP being one, added flexibility to the existing CARES dollars being another, because all those dollars have to be spent by the end of the year, which creates a limitation on how flexible and beneficial those dollars can in fact be. Um, Unfortunately, there's not widespread agreement, obviously, in the Senate and the House uh, and the White House as to how much and what should be included in the next stimulus package. We saw just yesterday that the $500 billion proposal from the Senate um, was voted down. Um, we knew that was going to get voted down immediately. I'm sure Majority Leader McConnell knew that was going to happen. It was a political tool. They're playing a game of chicken. And we are less and less optimistic that any deal is going to happen. And here's why we're concerned about this. Um, when we surveyed our members in July, we asked them what might happen if PPP round two didn't come together. And a significant percentage of them forecast layoffs and furloughs when their PPP dollars dry up. Half of the agencies had already expended uh, nearly all or all of their PPP dollars, and the remaining of them will have exhausted their PPP dollars by the end of October. So we're very concerned about that element of this. Furthermore, the cessation of federal supports directed individuals um, is creating a surge of need as both Joel and Rachel, I think, identified. Um, our food pantries alone have seen significant increases in, in uh, need the last month. In fact, one of our agencies saw a 20% increase in visits to their food pantries from one week to the next, from the last week of, I'm sorry, the second to last week of August to the last week of August. 
we think that's only going to expedite in numerous ways. And we're trying to use all of this data to try and push Congress to pass another stimulus deal, no matter how unlikely that might seem at this point. Furthermore, the city and the county's allocation for $20 million, which I talked about earlier, it was made today. Um, when they pulled that grant process together for those 20 million of CARES dollars, they anticipated maybe $40 million in asks, and that being an extraordinary figure. They received $91 million in asks from 247 organizations in Franklin County alone, with only $20 million to distribute. We're using that data point too to try and push our congressional delegation to get another stimulus deal through. And part of the ask is that dollars be made directly available to health and human services agencies across the country, um, including, of course, in Columbus and Franklin County. Um, there was a, a standalone bill that was put together in the US House back in April, I think, and that, of course, has gone nowhere. I'm not optimistic that such an element of an ex stimulus package would be included. Uh, but regardless, we, we believe it is imperative that there be dollars specifically for the health and human services sector to help us navigate through uh, and into 2021, especially since these CARES dollars have a timeline as to when they have to be spent. In Franklin County, they've determined that to be November 30, 2020. Um, fortunately, uh, as again, both Joel and Rachel forecast, the government revenue streams haven't been hit nearly as hard as was anticipated. That is true in Columbus as well. Just had that conversation uh, yesterday. Um, so we're, we're hopeful that that results in um, more investments from the city and the county than they expected they'd be able to make going into 2021. As they're thinking about their budgets for next year, we're pushing for the local investments to be greater than they have been in the past including and especially since we don't anticipate the federal government getting back into the game the way that we hoped that they would with another stimulus package. That's going to be really imperative, especially as the public health element of this begins to wane and the economic and other public health elements of this really begin to escalate in terms of the consequences they have on the sector and the need for services and the availability of agencies to provide those services. I will say too, um, there are a lot of people asking if nonprofits are going to start merging due to some of the financial constraints and losses of revenue. Um, and we haven't seen any mergers actually happen or be pursued uh, at this point. I do anticipate that to change into 2021, especially as uh, things uh, hopefully stabilize uh, in, in some areas and obviously continue to destabilize in others. Certain business models have just been hammered harder than, harder than others. And, and child care is one where uh, it's just been a significant challenge in school and after school programs are seeing significant hits all by themselves. And I'm worried about our immigration providers. Um, the federal government is obviously has not been a friend to immigration since January, 2017. And all of those pieces together where the federal government has really been attacking the health and human services sector um, through either threats of cuts or cuts um, has been a significant issue. While all of this is happening, we're worried about pending cuts to SNAP um, before the coronavirus hit, there was a move to cut 3 million people across the country from SNAP rolls. That's on pause. There is a pending move to uh, redefine or recalculate the federal poverty line. That hasn't moved yet um, for obvious reasons, we think. That could happen. Um, that could arbitrarily move people off of the availability for services when they need them the most. So we're, we're worried about that too. And of course, we're worried about the census and the next 10 years and how this could affect things. Um, and the federal government decided to um, cut off one month of, of counting um, arbitrarily recently. So that's, that's going to have an effect as well. So there are lots and lots of moving parts right now. And we're all waiting to see what happens on November 3rd, because what happens on November 3rd will dramatically affect the kind of resources that might continue flowing into 2021 into our local communities uh, and into our states to keep services available at a time when the need is as high as it's ever been. So I'm happy to uh, answer questions as well. Uh, I apologize. Uh, we're a one and a half person team here in Columbus. So we didn't get a, a presentation together. And I've been on the phone with the city and the county all morning um, with res in response to the, the $20 million that were distributed today. Um, so forgive me for not having that PowerPoint, but, but happy to help, happy to answer questions now and, and later as well. Thanks so much, Michael and Rachel and Joel for those great presentations. That's a lot of information, very up to the minute. Um, that is also very helpful, I think, in terms of um, the work that we do at Community Solutions and Advocates for Our House Future, having that um, 
up to the minute information to prepare us for um, what looks like another, you know, really intense round of advocacy for work at the federal level um, next week, I think is really, um, looks like that's what'll be on our plates <laughs> here for the, for the next several days. So um, I know Annie has been um, organizing the questions that have come in through the chat, so I will turn it over to her. Great, thank you, Tara, and um, thank you to our panelists and to the attendees. Um, I did want to point out real quick before we start asking the questions that the slides will be available immediately after today's webinar at the web address that you see on your screen, the comsols.com backslash webinar COVID local government. Um, so you should be able to access the slides immediately and the recording just as soon as it processes on our computers. Um, so we did get several questions throughout. I'm going to kind of ask them and any of the panelists, if you want to weigh in with your answers, please do. And we'll try to get through just as many as we can by uh, while being mindful of the time. Um, so the first question uh, was asked during Joel's presentation, should ODJFS defer renewals of all services, SNAP and others for another six months? And can ODJFS do this or is this a federal rule? Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, unfortunately, it's federal, uh, and at first we were able to quickly get, um, you know, these things extended, and then um, now the, the U.S. Department of Labor is only approving waivers month to month to month. So um, we're we're looking at it. In some ways, we're caught up. So doing some of the redeterminations sooner than better is good. Um, so you know, we can kind of put our foot in the water, you know, without jumping in full force uh, in the next couple of weeks. But at some point here in the very near future, it's going to be a real problem if we don't get uh, some type of relief, but it would require federal support to be able to do that. Great. Um, this next question, I think will be for all of our panelists. Uh, what creative strategies are being used now to spend existing CARES dollars where they're needed, given the current spending restrictions? I can speak to that in Columbus. Um, so with the $20 million grant piece that they put together, they divided it up into two different areas. One, um, to fill the hole for agencies that had lost monies due to the coronavirus, um, fundraisers that had to get canceled, fee for services that were lost, so on and so forth. And two, to reimburse for new expenses that were created by the coronavirus, protective equipment, sanitizing of your spaces. Um, a lot of agencies had to buy refrigerators to store food so it wouldn't spoil. A lot of organizations had to temporarily rent or renovate facilities so they could socially distance. For example, the homeless shelters having to work with hotels to spread people out, things of that nature. Um, that's been a significant area right there. And just on PPE reimbursement alone, our member organizations have spent $2.1 million on PPE alone since March. So using CARES dollars for simple things like that has been, has been there. Um, I suspect that one of the reasons why governments have been sitting on the CARES dollars a little bit rather than spending it all right away is they wanted to see A, where things were shifting, B, how their revenue streams were being affected, and C, if Congress was going to add flexibility on when these CARES dollars could be spent. There is bipartisan agreement that the CARES dollars should be spent well into 2021, but they've got to pass the bill to make that happen. They haven't done it yet. So we're hoping that that is the case, but I think you're going to see a scramble in the next couple of weeks if they read the tea leaves and Congress is going to do that, that the city and the counties in particular are going to start getting that money out the door. And it'll be really interesting to see if everybody can spend it fast enough. That's going to be a challenge. They'll have, 30 to 60 days to do so. It's going to be tough. Yeah, if I can just add to that, um, Danny was kind enough to just share a couple of links in the chat box. Um, CCAO and OBM have put together some charts of how the money can be spent and how it is being spent. Um, and I think Michael is spot on. Like, it is going to be difficult to spend all the money, especially if we get that extra $650 million across the state out to our local governments before technically December, but th the date right now is actually local governments have to spend it by mid-October. Otherwise, it gets redistributed, redis 
I'm sorry, redistributed. I don't know why I can't say that word today. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, it, it, it will be, um, there will be another distribution. Um, they'll take the money actually from local governments that don't spend what they were given and then send it to other local governments that did spend their whole allocation. So, um, you know, I, I think a lot of counties in, in the social services space, some of them are actually using some of the CARES dollars to supplement their PRC programs for some um, individuals who, you know, do not qualify for TANF, um, helping with utility shutoffs, like Joel said. Um, there are, I could sit here for like an hour and talk to you about all the ways they're spending it. So I really encourage you to look at those charts um, to see. And, you know, I know a lot of them are talking about buying refrigerators for vaccines now. So that's another thing that they're doing. They're really, um, they've been focused a lot on that next step of this but there are um, a lot of ways that they're sending it. Yeah, if I could just jump in real quickly. Um, county agencies themselves, lots of them are using the CARES Act dollars to upgrade equipment. As I had talked about earlier, we've seen just the advantages of having the right type. You know, Surface Pros in particular are um, really showing their value and the flexibility. When this all hit in March, I, I never thought I'd see it, but as the state was instructing counties to go ahead and get, get you know, these mass groups. I mean, if you go into a county agency, you could have cubicles on top of each other and everything. And they said, look, just let everybody take their equipment, go home. And I never thought I'd see a day where we'd be unplugging, you know, our, our desktops and our monitors and all of those types of things and loading them into our cars and taking them out of the building. Um, but it really isn't practical and it's really not as easy for, for a variety of, of reasons. So we've used, uh, lots of our counties have used it to upgrade their computers, their phones, have docking stations, second monitors, keyboards, all of those types of things that are usually pretty outdated and, and just to upgrade our equipment, which will help us not just now, but into the future. Um, in addition to things Michael was talking about with the PPEs, we're also using a lot of our counties are upgrading their buildings, adding plexiglass dividers, uh, and doing things to make it safer so that as we do bring more people back into the agencies, we'll be able to do it. Uh, as far as services are concerned, lots of our counties are using it. We, we have the TANF-funded uh, PRC or Prevention and Retention Contingency Program, which allows us to do a lot of emergency services and job supports, but it's only allowable for families and generally under 200% of poverty. So counties are uh, using some of these, these dollars to provide it to adults that do not have children, lots of senior services, transportation services, things that wouldn't meet that, you know, with all the rules and regulations and things that come with all the other funding streams, they don't exist for for these dollars. So we're utilizing it. Um, uh, lots of counties are now looking at it for rent assistance. And I think it's an area where the advocates can be working with us uh, as well. And, you know, just helping individuals to understand that that rent bill is still due just because you can't be evicted. You know, generally, you know, a lot of our folks that we, we work with, um, when they get the bill is when they deal with it. So if they're not getting a bill, you know, that, or they're not getting the eviction notice that they don't feel the, the stress. But if we can help provide some of those payments, hopefully we can maybe forestall or, or prevent some of those things from happening. Uh, one of the other things I started hearing last week, and I heard from several Appalachian counties, and I think others are looking, is while there's been a moratorium on a lot of the utilities and things, uh, water bills have not been included in that. So we're starting to see a lot of requests to utilize CARES Act dollars to help individuals uh, prevent shutoffs of, of water. Uh, and sewage. Um, one more thing I thought about while Joe was talking, I don't know if Michael maybe mentioned this, but um, broadband Wi-Fi access for schools. Um, yeah, so that is something that a lot of our counties have been helping their school districts with and have gotten really creative and um, did contracts actually through the next year, just paid all up front. So the money would all be spent now, but it would be good for a year, um, which I think is great. Yeah, absolutely, Rachel. Huge issue in Columbus. People always think of that as a, a rural challenge, but it's just a bigger challenge in big cities. Uh, and actually, the city of Columbus allocated $7 million for Chromebooks for Columbus City School students. A big challenge with all of this has been, okay, all these organizations and schools and whatnot might have the technology and the hardware and the software, but the clients or the students don't. Um, so there have been CARES dollars allocated in that way as well. Great, and we are running up 
on the two o'clock. So uh, we do have one more quick question. Rachel was asked during your presentation, but again, any panelists feel free to weigh in. Um, it was, uh, someone heard mention of funding for tutoring for school-aged children through DC. Any news on that? I am not, I'm not familiar with that. That doesn't mean it didn't happen. <laughs> um, so, you know, I can check with John Honick in our office has really been keeping a close eye on what's going on in DC. So I can check with him and maybe get the answer to you guys and um, we can follow up. Great, thank you. And just want to uh, point everyone to the website afterwards where there will be a recording, a copy of the slides and the resources that Rachel shared. Um, that's at comsals.com backslash webinar COVID local government. And Tara, I will turn things back over to you to close out today's webinar. Thank you again, everyone. Thanks, Danny. And thank you so much again to our speakers. We I learned a lot. That's a lot happening at <laughs> every every level of government um, in every county across the state, and I'm sure country. We're you know all being very creative, resourceful, um, as much as we can continue to do to help um, with all of this. Just we'll we'll all continue to to stay informed and communicate with one another and really appreciate all of the time you all took to provide these updates today. Um, we wanted to, again, thank you all for joining us today. Next week, um, same time, 1 p.m. on Friday, September 18th, we will be hosting a webinar focusing in on um, the impact of COVID, more focused at the state level, so that state budget. Um, confirmed, we have someone joining us from the Office of Budget and Management to talk about the budget guidance that they've given to state agencies and kind of how that's been um, informed and, and adapted as a result of the situation that the budget is in now. Um, we also will have someone joining us from the Department of Job and Family Services to talk about kind of how they're, you know, what, what they're able to share with us right now around how they're prioritizing different areas of their budget. Um, maybe more speakers to be um, confirmed still. So that is always um, last can be last minute when we're when we're trying to get very busy people confirmed for webinars. So thank you all again for joining us today. Please keep a lookout for registration information for next week. Um, we encourage you to join for this um, September series, and then I will turn it over to Kelsey for any last words. Thank you. Well said, Tara. Just want to echo my thanks to our panelists. Um, it's, it's nice to be back, right? This is really nice to be back together again on Friday afternoons. Looking forward to the rest of our series uh, through September. And thank you for participating and for, for joining us today to our viewers. And we'll be back next week. Have a great weekend and stay safe.